was very glad that Aaron told me didn't have to wear that mask. I, I really feel for people who have a job where they wear one of these things all day. I think I, would, I wouldn't like that at all. I did preach once with a mask on, and that was bad enough, you know. You have an itchy nose, what you do, you know, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not pleasant, so I'm glad I don't have to wear that. It is interesting, as you go from one assembly to another, I've been in a few recently, it's interesting to notice the, the variations, the differences that there are in the way that um, God's people meet together. I was uh, with an assembly just a couple of weeks ago. They celebrated the Lord's Supper, and, uh, and I preached via Zoom. And they have no intentions of meeting together in their building until at least next year. So that's one extreme. The other extreme was I was in another place where they have never changed. They just carried on. Small assembly. No masks, no physical distancing. We weren't altogether comfortable, but that's the other extreme. And uh, between those uh, two extremes, there is, uh, there is some variation. But it's good to be with you. Personally, I much prefer to meet with God's people rather than Zoom. Very thankful for the technology, but it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really um, measure up to the privilege of actually being together physically. I want to read this morning from the book of Genesis in chapter 39. We've been in Genesis already a couple of times, but we're going to go to chapter 39 this morning, and we're going to read about Joseph. In chapter 39, we'll read the entire chapter. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, Captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph. He was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord had made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was in all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. He has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside, that she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. And so it was, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, that she called to the men of her house, and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew, a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept the garment with her until her master came home. And then she spoke to him with, he, with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted up my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So it was when the, his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph, showed him mercy. And he gave him favor on the sight of the keeper of the prison. The keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The 
keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that we have this privilege of meeting, as we've done this morning, to remember the Lord Jesus. It was his request that we do this, and we thank you that we have been able to do this in obedience to his word, but also because we desire to do that, that we might indeed remember him and worship him because he is worthy. We thank you, too, that we have an opportunity to open your word. And so as we open it now, and as we have read this uh, chapter together, we pray that you would direct what is said and direct our thinking, that we might hear from yourself, not just the voice of a man, but that we may hear a message from you which is directed to each one of us. Would you bless us as we are before you, we do ask you, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I want to consider three questions as we look at this chapter together, Genesis chapter 39. The first question is, what did, Jake, what did Joseph experience? The second question is, why did Joseph suffer? And the third question is, how did Joseph respond? It certainly wasn't easy for Joseph, was it? It certainly wasn't easy. We're not given any indication of uh, how long he suffered down in the land of Egypt. In Genesis 37, we are told that he was 17 years old, and I take it that that is how old he was when his brothers sold him down into the land of Egypt, 17. We are told later that he was 30 when he stood before Pharaoh, and so there are 13 years as a slave in the house of Potiphar and in the prison. How long in each, we don't know. We do know that the butler forgot about him for two years. So we know he was in the prison for at least two years. I fancy most of the 13 years, I would imagine, were in prison. It wasn't easy for him. It wasn't easy. He was a favored son of his father, wasn't he? It says in Genesis 37 that uh, he loved him. Jacob loved him. Jacob honored him. Jacob gave him a place which was uh, uniquely his, apart from his brothers. And it was one thing for him to, to enjoy that, to enjoy the favor and the love of his father and the privilege of being there in that home in Hebron, where I don't doubt he was, uh, he was happy. Undoubtedly, that was one thing for him to enjoy, but, uh, but this is altogether different. His brothers hate him. His brothers get rid of him. They sell him as a slave down to Egypt, and here he is in the house of Potiphar and eventually in the prison. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. There's a comment about Joseph in Psalm 105, verse 18, which says, they hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons. And I don't doubt that there is some poetic uh, liberty there. I don't think we to take that uh, literally. But it does tell us something about the suffering which Joseph experienced. It wasn't easy. It wasn't deserved either, was it? I mean, I, I know he provoked his brothers somewhat, didn't he, with uh, those dreams. I mean, uh, it wasn't altogether uh, something that they would have found uh, pleasing, that he would suggest that uh, one day they were going to bow down to him. That's not what they wanted to hear. And so he did provoke them a bit. Nevertheless, he didn't deserve the treatment which he received. They treated him cruelly and, uh, and sold him for, what was it, 30 pieces of, of silver. And he didn't deserve the treatment he got in the house of Potiphar. This woman, Potiphar's wife, why she was, uh, well, obviously, she was untrustworthy. She was persistent, wasn't she? Day by day, we're told there in verse, in verse 10, she was manipulative. She was bold, and uh, when she doesn't have her way, then it turns out that she is deceitful and malicious and spiteful. And Joseph ends up in prison. It wasn't fair. Didn't deserve it. Actually, in this respect, he is a picture of the Lord Jesus, isn't he? Because certainly the Lord Jesus didn't deserve the treatment that he received. You remember the words of that thief, the dying thief, he said to the one who had railed on the Lord Jesus and says, well, if you're who you say you are, well, come, come down from the cross, save yourself, save us. 
And the other one turned on him and says, look, you don't know what you're talking about. We are getting what we deserve. This man has done nothing amiss. Didn't deserve. He didn't deserve that kind of treatment. Nevertheless, that was what happened to him. There is a verse in the book of the Acts and in chapter 8 where Philip is reading from Isaiah 53 and this is how it's rendered in Acts chapter 8. It says there, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Isaiah 53 in my Bible says he was taken from prison and from judgment. But Philip, he renders it this way, in his humiliation, his judgment or his claim for justice was taken away. That's really what it amounts to. There was no justice, was there? I mean, you think about the trial of the Lord Jesus. It was a mockery of a trial. The charges were invalid. The testimony that was brought against him was unreliable. There were no basis, no legal basis for the conclusions of the court. You think about Caiaphas. Caiaphas, he wants to know, are you the son of God? And when the Lord Jesus acknowledges that that is so, why he tears his garment, Caiaphas tears his garment. He says, well, what, what, what further evidence do we need? Uh, what do you think? Well, we should, we should be rid of him. Well, he said he was the son of God. Is that a reason to get rid of him? Is that a reason to kill him? As far as Pilate was concerned, Pilate knew better, didn't he? Pilate knew that for envy they had delivered him. They knew what they were up to. He knew what was going on. And, uh, and he was of a mind to wash his hands. He did so, didn't he? He, would have, as of a, he was of a mind to wash his hands altogether of this matter. He didn't want to get involved. But uh, they say, hey, you let him go. You're not Caesar, friend. And so against his better judgment, he condemned the Lord Jesus. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. And it wasn't so with Joseph. Peter tells us in his letter that there are three kinds of suffering. He tells us that we can suffer because we deserve to suffer. He says uh, to us, the slaves, he says, what profit is it when you're buffeted, if you're buffeted for your faults? In other words, you've, des you've done something that deserves some kind of judgment, some kind of punishment. Uh, and then secondly, he tells us that uh, we can suffer in spite of doing the right thing. He says, uh, but he says, if, if when you do well and you suffer for it, well, that is praiseworthy. In spite of the fact that you do the right thing, you suffer. That sometimes happens, doesn't it, in life? You know, when you, you're a youngster, your brother, your brother says something about you, tells a tale about you that isn't true. And, uh, but you get into trouble for it. I mean, it happens. It happens at school happens in the workplace that uh, there is deception and lying and, uh, and people suffer unnecessarily because of what others are, are saying and doing. And then thirdly, Peter tells us that there is suffering not only in spite of doing the right thing, but actually because of doing the right thing. He talks about suffering as a Christian. He talks about suffering for righteousness sake. That is suffering that's not merited. That is some suffering that comes into the lives of individuals because they belong to Christ and they stand for Christ. And in a sense, this is what was true here of, of, uh, of Joseph then. There was no, there was no reason for, for the judgment that uh, was passed on him. He was doing the right thing. I suppose if he'd gone along with that lady and her request, then uh, he wouldn't have suffered this way. He may have suffered in other ways, but he wouldn't have ended up in prison unless, of course, her husband found out about it. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that it wasn't fair. It wasn't easy. And it wasn't fair. That's what Joseph experienced. Well, the second question is, well, how did Joseph suffer? Why did Joseph suffer? Why? That's a question we could ask every day, isn't it? As we look out in our world um, every day, pretty well, we might raise our eyebrows and say, well, why? Why would God allow that? Why would God allow this young man to be killed in an accident? And there's a, there's a young spouse, a young woman left with some children. Why? Why? At the other end of the spectrum, I have an aunt who's 102 years of age and uh, my only relative in Canada, apart from my wife and our own children. 
and uh, she has absolutely no quality of life. You know, they have to carry her everywhere, and she sits in a wheelchair, and you wonder, well, why? Why doesn't the Lord take her? Why? Why is it allowed in that way? I mean, there are all kinds of things where that happen. We could ask questions. I mean, why, why the Holocaust? <laughs> why the coronavirus? I mean, there are questions which arise every day, and we wonder, well, why? Why, why is God allowing this to happen? The interest, of course, well, he looks, at, uh, he looks at disaster and suffering, and he says, well, we live in a chaotic world. Things just happen by, by random. We're the victims of blind chance. So there isn't any point in, uh, in wondering why. The cynic, the cynic might raise questions about God, and he might say, well, God, if God exists, does he know what's going on? Uh, and if he knows what is going on, is he able to do something about it? And if he knows what's going on and he's able to do something about it, do, does he care? Does he care? There are questions which are raised with respect to the knowledge of God and the power of God and the love of God. But it's obvious as we look at Joseph's situation, there was, there was no lack of knowledge on God's part. God knew exactly what was going on. God knew in advance what was going to go on. He knew exactly where Joseph was. He knew exactly what Joseph felt. There's no lack of knowledge with God. Doesn't the psalmist say in 139, you have searched me and known me. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down, you know when I rise up, you know when I go out, you know what I say, you know what I think, you know what I feel, you know it, the psalmist says, you know it altogether. And so there's no lack of knowledge with God. There's no lack of power. Certainly not. I mean, it was God who gave Pharaoh these dreams, and it was God who gave Joseph the interpretation of those dreams. It was God who sent those bumper crops during those seven years of plenty. It was God who sent the seven years of famine. God was in control all the way through. There's no lack of power as far as God's concerned, and there's no lack of concern. You might think, well, did he really care about Joseph? Well, he did. You notice it says there in verse 2 that the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And indeed, uh, we, we, the, the, in verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with Joseph. And similarly, when he ends up in the prison, it says about him down in verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And in verse 21, the keeper of the house, he saw that, uh, that the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. The Lord cared about Joseph. Certainly he did. The Lord was involved. The Lord was there with him. And so it's, there was no lack of knowledge on God's part. There was no lack of power. And there was no lack of concern. Well, why then did Joseph suffer? Go forward with me to Genesis 45 for a moment. Genesis chapter 45. And Joseph is now uh, number two in the land of Egypt. The years of uh, plenty have gone, the years of famine have arrived, and indeed his brothers have arrived. They have come down from Egypt to get, to get some food. Initially, he treats them somewhat roughly, sends them packing, uh, gives them the food, mind you, and their money for that matter, and sends them on their way and says, don't come back unless you bring your younger brother. Well, they come back with their younger brother. And in Genesis chapter 45, Joseph makes himself known to them. And he says to them in verse 3, I am Joseph. I can't imagine what they felt. Wow. I mean, they, they knew what they'd done. They knew what they'd done was cruel and wrong. And here is this man, Joseph, in this position of authority. Now we're in for it. Now we're in for it. They trembled, did they not? I'm sure they trembled and they wept. As they, uh, as they heard those words, it says in verse 3 that they were dismayed. They were dismayed in his presence. But in verse 4, Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. Notice what he says. At the end of verse 5, God sent me before you to preserve life. In verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. And in verse 9, in verse, uh, no, that's not verse 9, 7, 8, and uh, uh, 
I've got, there's a third reference and I can't find the verse. Oh yeah, verse eight, verse eight. So now, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Three times he says it. Three times he says it, it wasn't you. Well, of course it was them. <laughs> well, they hated him, didn't they? they? They plotted against him. They saw him coming and they determined, hey, what are we gonna do to this young fella, this brother of ours, this upstart? And so, and so they did it. They put him in the pit and subsequently they took him, they sold him to the Ishmaelites. They did it, of course they did. But Joseph says, it wasn't you that sent me here. It was God. Why? Well, go back to what I read in verse 5. God sent me before you to preserve life. And again, in verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Joseph was God's appointed savior, if you will for his own family and uh, for the Egyptians and for other peoples and other nations who also came to Egypt for food during those years of famine. God had a purpose. God's purpose was that Joseph would be the one he would use in order to preserve life and in order to preserve a posterity for you in the earth. God knew what he was doing. Again, we think in terms of the, the life of the Lord Jesus. Well, it's certainly true, isn't it, as we think about the death of the Lord Jesus, that, that men did it. Of course they did. Men did it. Satan put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. And, uh, and the leaders of the nation, the Sanhedrin, why they came up with those charges, they were motivated by envy and by hatred, and they determined to be rid of him, and they brought him to Pilate. And Pilate, as I said earlier, against his better judgment, he passes sentence on the Lord Jesus. And then the Roman soldiers, eventually, they take him and they crucify him. Men did it. No question about it. And indeed, Peter, in, in Acts chapter 2, we were there earlier as well, but a little bit later in Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter, in that message that he delivers, he says, you took him. And with wicked hands, you crucified him and you slew him. You did it. And then he adds this. He says, he was delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God. God did it. God did it. God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God made him to be sin for us, the one who knew no sin. Isaiah 53, over there earlier as well, in Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, we are told, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It's a remarkable statement, isn't it? How could God get any kind of pleasure out of that? Please the Lord to bruise him. He did it. And it brought him pleasure. Well, how could that be so? Well, Isaiah continues, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. You made his soul an offering for sin. It was a purpose. It was a purpose. God had his, uh, God had his agenda. God knew what it was. He, he was desirous of accomplishing. He wanted to bl bring rebels like you and me into a relationship with himself. His love, his love reaches out to us. He knows that we're sinners. He knows uh, all about us. Nevertheless, he so loves us. He, he is motivated by his concern for us. And so he wants to reach out to us. He wants to make us his own. He wants to bring us into a relationship. And his righteousness would forbid him just forgetting about our sin. He, he can't just sweep it under the carpet and say, well, I love you, so that's fine. And welcome us into his family. He can't do that. And what was the answer? You made his soul an offering for sin. God made to meet upon him the iniquity of us all. The Lord Jesus was the only way, the only way by which we could be brought back to a relationship with God was by means of a perfect sacrifice for sin. And only the Lord Jesus could offer that sacrifice. And so God planned it. And God promised it. And God allowed it to happen. And God used Satan and Pilate and the Sanhedrin and even Herod and the Roman soldiers. He used them to bring about what he purposed. 
Why did the Lord Jesus suffer? Because God desired and that he become a sacrifice for us and that he might be our savior. William Cowper, he, uh, he was someone who experienced a good deal of um, heartache in his life, somebody who was, who was a, a strong believer. We sing some of his hymns, don't we? A number of his hymns, fine hymns. He was a man who, who suffered very serious periods of deep depression. And uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the poems that he wrote says this, God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform, he plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm, deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill. He treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. And then he goes on and says this, blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. He will make it plain. But not necessarily in this life. Not necessarily in this life. It may be, it may be that we will be able at some point to look back on some of the things that have happened to us and say, oh, that's why. Just as Joseph was able to. During those years as a slave and as a prisoner, he might, he might have wondered, well, what is, what is this all about? I have had this word from the Lord and uh, this promise from God. So, so what is this all about? And he may, he may have questioned what is going on. Years later, he can look back and there is, uh, there is an understanding. It may be in our lives that, uh, that the, the time will come when we can look at certain things which were very difficult and we'll be able to say, ah, yes, there was a reason for that. But not necessarily. Not necessarily. There is no simple answer to the question, why? Why do people suffer? Why does that disaster occur? I spent a lot of time over the last uh, six months studying the book of Job, and uh, I preached on it in our assembly, I think, I don't know, 10 times or something. It's a, it's a fascinating book. And you remember what happens to Job. Job, Job loses everything. He loses his possession. He loses his possessions, he, he loses his family, and uh, he loses his health. And all the way through that boat, the question which is uppermost in his mind is, why? Why? He cries out to God. He wants to have a face-to-face -face with God. He wants to inquire, well, why is it that this is taking place? And at the end of the book, God speaks to him. But he doesn't give him an explanation. And Job is left without really any clear statement from God as to why it was he was going through the things that he was going through. We need to know, as he did, he need, we need to know that God is in control. That's the message that God delivers to him. In effect, in effect when it comes to the end of the book, God says to him, look, Job, uh, who do you think you are? You should take a look at who I am. You should understand who I am. We need to know that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. We need to know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We don't need to know why. We don't need to know why. We need to know that nothing can happen outside the sphere of God's influence. We need to know that uh, no circumstances are such that he cannot change them. And no circumstances arise but that he allows them to occur. We need to know that history is not just a series of random events, but they are directed by God towards the accomplishment of his purpose. We need to know that everything that happens is orchestrated by God for the fulfillment of what he has intended to do. Why did Joseph suffer? Well, that means, brings us to the third question. Well, then, how did, how did Joseph respond? How did he respond? Well, we can say how he didn't respond. There is no suggestion of any anger or bitterness is there on the part of Joseph. Uh, we don't find him having a pity party, you know, in the house of Potiphar. On the contrary, I think it's evident that here was somebody who adjusted to the life of a slave, somebody who was obedient, somebody who was diligent, 
I mean, why else would Pontifer promote him? He saw that this was a young man who could be depended upon, somebody who was faithful, and so, and so he, uh, he promotes him. And the same thing happened when he was in the prison. It says there, doesn't it, in the, in the chapter that we read, that uh, the keeper of the prison did not look at anything that was under Joseph's authority. And so the, it's obvious that he was somebody who demonstrated a, a positive attitude. He didn't, he's not bitter. He's not angry. And there's no desire for retaliation either, is there? I mean, I kind of wonder what Mrs. Potiphar felt when she heard about this young Hebrew who was now promoted to be <laughs> number two in the land of Egypt. She might have thought, well, I'm in for it. But there's no suggestion of that. His brothers, when they come down there in chapter 45 and Joseph says, I am Joseph, they are dismayed. They think, no, we're in for it, but not so. No desire for retaliation and no self-pity. Why? Well, I read, a, I recorded already from Psalm 105, verse 18. Verse 19 of that psalm, speaking about Joseph, says this, until the time that his word, God's word, came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. Joseph had a word from the Lord. Those dreams. That was a promise from God. That was an indication to him as to what God was going to do. He may have doubted it. He may have questioned, well, why am I in the prison? But uh, it's obvious that he was holding on. The word of the Lord tested him. but He didn't give up on God. He didn't give up on God's word. We know that. The butler and the baker, they come to him one morning and they say, uh, wait, wait, I had a dream. And Joseph says, well, well, tell me your dream. God can interpret your dreams. Why would he say that? He might have said to them, oh, dreams. Huh. I had some dreams. I dreamt that um, my brothers and even my parents, they were going to bow down to me and I'd look at me. I dreams, uh, forget about it. Get on with your life. He might have said that, but he says, no. He says, tell me your dream. Interpretations belong to God. He says the same thing to Pharaoh, doesn't he? Pharaoh has a dream and uh, a couple of dreams. And Joseph is brought before him and he says, he says to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's going to do. He believed in dreams. He believed in the divine interpretation of dreams. He believed in his own dreams. He was holding on fast, you see, to the word that, uh, the promise that he'd been given, the word of the Lord that tested him. He didn't profess to understand. I'm sure not. He didn't. I'm sure he, uh, he didn't know why he was in the prison, why he was a slave in Potiphar's house, but he was confident that God's purpose would be fulfilled in his time and in his way. What it means, as far as we're concerned this morning, is that we may never in this life come to understand why things occur and that we find difficult to accept and to experience. We may never in this life come to understand them. But we can trust in God, who is in control of every situation and knows what he's doing and never makes a mistake. All things work together for good. He didn't say that all things are good. They're not. They're not. He says all things work together for good. God has his purpose, and he knows what he's doing. It's not for us to question why. We don't have to understand why. What is called for is not an understanding of why this is, is, is happening, but what is called for is faith in God, who is working out his purposes. Cory Tan Boom says that never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. What sustains in the crisis of life is not a knowledge of God's purpose, but a knowledge of God and trusting in Him, recognizing that He's powerful. He can do whatever it is he wants to do. He can surely do whatever it is that he has purposed, recognizing he's wise. He knows what he's doing. He never makes a mistake. Recognizing that he's righteous. He can never, never do things such that he's charged with being unrighteous and unfair. Recognize he's loving. He cares deeply for us as his own 
and recognizing that he is the sovereign Lord of the universe. We can trust him. We may not know why, but we can trust him. And we can come to know him. Let me conclude with the words of it, one of my favorite hymns. And it says this, Not what I am, O Lord, but what thou art, that, that alone can be my soul's true rest. Thy love, not mine, bids fear and doubt depart and stills the tempest of my throbbing breast. Tis what I know of thee, my Lord and God, that fills my soul with peace, my lips with song. Thou art my health, my joy, my staff, my rod. Leaning on thee in weakness I am strong. More of thyself. O oh, show me hour by hour. More of thy glory. O oh, my God and Lord. More of thyself. In all thy grace and power. More of thy love and truth. Incarnate word. Father, we thank you. We thank you this morning for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that he stands right at the center of your purposes. His death certainly was something that you purposed. And we thank you that going beyond that, you have purposes which will yet be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. And they must surely be fulfilled because nothing can interfere with what it is that you have determined to go, determined, determined to do. It doesn't depend on the cooperation of men, and it cannot be frustrated by the attempts of Satan, but you will surely do what you have promised to do. We pray, Father, that we might rest in this this morning, that whatever the situation might be that we find ourselves in, that we might have a confidence in you, recognizing that you are in control, and we pray that you would deepen our appreciation of you, deepen our knowledge of you, so that we might love you more and worship you because you are worthy. We thank you for our time together this morning. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen.